Although before now there was visible in a certain person a flickering light such that one could judge that he was ordained by God for Italy's redemption, nevertheless it was seen afterward how, at the very peak of his exertions, he was rejected by fortune, with the result that, remaining as though lifeless, Italy awaits whoever it could be who can heal her wounds and put an end to the sackings of Lombardy and to the ransoms demanded from Naples and Tuscany and cure her of the sores with which she has been infested for so long. One sees how she prays to God that he sent someone to redeem her from these cruelties and barbaric insolences. One sees her still completely ready and disposed to follow a banner, provided there be someone who takes it up. Nor is there to be seen at present anyone in whom she could hope more than in your illustrious house, which, with its fortune and virtue favored by God and by the church, of which it is now the prince, can make itself the leader of this redemption. Thus, it will not be very difficult if you will keep in mind the actions and lives of the men named above. Although such men are rare and marvelous, nonetheless they were men, and each of them had a lesser opportunity than the present one, for their undertakings were not more just than this, nor easier, nor was God more a friend to them than to you. Here there is great justice. For war is just for those for whom it is necessary, and arms are pious, where there is no hope save in arms. Here there is greatest readiness, and where there is great readiness there cannot be great difficulty, provided that your house takes up the institutions of those persons whom I have proposed for your aim. Beyond this, see here the extraordinary things, without precedent, conducted by God. The sea has opened, a cloud has shown you the way, the stone has poured forth water, here the manna has rained down. All things have come together for your greatness. The remainder you have to do yourselves. God does not want to do all things, so as not to take away our free will or any part of the glory that belongs to us. So chapter 26 poses a puzzle to uh, interpreters because Machiavelli mentions God as we've just seen in the second paragraph, so much. In one paragraph, four or five times mentions God. This he had not done at all in the previous 25 chapters. Previous 25 chapters have presented an idea of history from a naturalistic perspective, in which essentially violence and cunning and luck, fortuna, are the ultimate determinants of the ups and downs of fortunes in political life. There was no divine intervention. Um, here Machiavelli instead proposes a different view on history, one which is taken from a sacred or biblical if one wants conception of history where the fundamental question is God's providence or God's government. What does God want from human beings? And what can human beings ask from their God or gods? So the big puzzle here is how can we bring together a naturalistic vision of history and a providential vision of history? The second puzzle on chapter 26 has to do with the fact that Machiavelli is talking about redeeming all of Italy, not just Florence, not just Milan, not just Naples, all of Florence and from foreign invasions. These invaders mainly were the northern monarchies, more or less recent monarchies, which were characterized by absolute monarchs. Therefore Machiavelli seems to hint that the liberator of Italy will have to be also an absolute monarch, therefore not the kind of civic prince that he theorizes in chapters uh, 7, 8, and 9. Civic prince meaning a prince that comes to power through the favor of some part of the people or through some other uh, factor that is not under their control, but therefore that has to maintain power uh, in a civic-minded or civic rule-bounded way. Uh, and Machiavelli seems to discard this option uh, in, in this case. 
so we have here another uh, tension between a possible call for an absolute monarch at the end of the book, a book which had been a theory of the principality from a civic or republican perspective uh, up until that moment. So how do we uh, account for this leap or this discontinuity in Machiavelli's reasoning that appears in chapter 26? This is, in short, the big puzzle that uh, has faced every interpreter of this work. Now, the key, of course, is to think about what kind of God is Machiavelli uh, calling for here. Now, the whole chapter 26 uh, has to do with war. That is, we are talking about a liberator, a redeemer of Italy that will have to engage in war against foreign invaders. And in fact, soon after the paragraph that I just read, Machiavelli goes into a long, rather relatively long excursus on the best kind of army that uh, the new prince should uh, build. So here we have, Machiavelli is calling for a god that will favor war to begin with and not peace. So we're talking about a warrior god, not a god whose representative on earth, for example, Jesus Christ, was known for giving the other cheek when someone offends you or violates you as a sign of being a true Christian. So uh, I tend to think that the God that Machiavelli is here referring to is not one that comes from the Christian tradition, but must be found in other monotheistic traditions that were also in Europe and that could have very easily uh, arrived um, or did in fact arrive into Italy. And I'm referring to both the Jewish and the Arabic philosophical and political thinking with regards to divine providence and with regards to God. Uh, in particular, the Hebrew political understanding of God seems to be much closer to what Machiavelli uh, wants than the Christian one. Uh, first of all, because in the Hebrew understanding, God is an active participant in the affairs of his chosen people, and in fact is referred to as a commander-in-chief of the people organized as God's army. For here, there is no problem whatsoever of understanding divine providence directly in terms of how best to constitute an army that is going to repel foreign enemies and establish its own national state, which is what Machiavelli seems to be after in this case. Um, additionally, uh, God's chosen people in the Hebrew model have a republican uh, constitution in the sense that God is the king and therefore there can be no other human king that takes his place on earth. This is until, of course, later on, the Hebrew people decide that they want to be like other nations and they ask God uh, for permission to adopt their own human kings, which essentially unravels the Hebrew Republic um, and uh, causes great travails for the Hebrew people. But before that point, uh, uh, there, uh, the solution is then for God to give his people a constitution. Uh, the constitution prevents any human being uh, from having absolute power over the people, therefore the people is free. But of course, uh, uh, this constitution gives pride of place to the figure of Moses. Now Moses is a strange figure in the setup because he is a quasi-regal person, has quasi-kingly powers, but is there, has all these powers, precisely to prevent anybody to become a real king. Therefore, we have a quasi-king who is at the service of a republican intention and a republican constitution. And it seems to me not far-fetched to think that Machiavelli's appeal to a 
quasi-absolute monarch in this last chapter, maybe Machiavelli might have in the back of his mind the figure of Moses as this paradoxically uh, king without being king. Now, in the Hebrew political theology, there is another figure who is also a king and at the same time an anti-king. And this is a figure who is, so to speak, at the other opposite pole of Moses. And this is the figure of the Messiah. Now, Machiavelli in this text, in this long citation, uh, clearly his rhetoric is very uh, messianic. Yes, he's calling for God, or he's saying that Italy is praying to God to send them a liberator, a, a king or a quasi-king that will free them. Um, and this is, in fact, is the same as calling for a messianic leader. Now, why uh, in the Hebrew political tradition there is a tension between Moses and the Messiah, beginning and end of the history of this free people. And I think it's interesting, why do I say that here there is both in this chapter, one can see a kind of messianic, trace and also mosaic trace and I think the key is the role of the people because um, when Machiavelli discusses the figure of Moses in chapter 6 and he takes him as an example Moses is the example of someone who gave a political form given to him by God of course uh, to a people who had no education and freedom a people that have been entirely enslaved uh, therefore, an unfree people, a people that had to be trained or taught to be free uh, in the first place. Now, with the messianic leader, this is no longer the case. The messianic leader is no longer faced with a people which has no vitality, no freedom. And I think this is why Machiavelli's discourse in chapter 26 takes on a messianic language and not is not simply a return to the figure of Moses because Machiavelli insists that it's the Italian people that is always already, so to speak, alive and free and that the reason that they have been enslaved is due to a series of rotten heads, so to speak, of bad princes that were not able to constitute to give a form to this natural freedom found in the Italian people. And this is exactly therefore why Machiavelli's language would be messianic rather than mosaic because the Messiah is a king or the leader or the head of a people that is free in the sense that they don't need a king or a leader or a head. The Messiah is this paradoxical king or head of a free and living, headless people. And I think this is what Machiavelli is pointing at uh, at the end of his book. And this explains why he would put together, on the one hand, appeals to a mosaic, quasi-regal figure, a messianic leader, uh, and have a long disquisition on the best form of army, which happens to be a people's army, a republican army, without there being there a conflict, ultimately, between the ideal of a people in arm, which is a republican ideal, and the need for a quasi-monarchic head to lead them into battle a battle which is a political-theological sense, uh, or contains a political-theological sense of war. And I think, to conclude, it is only if we look at divine providence and divine government from a non-Christian tradition, uh, from a Jewish and also, very importantly, Arabic uh, political theology uh, that this starts to make more sense.